All right, everybody, how you doing out there? I'm Thomas, and welcome to my channel. I do educational videos on mostly obscure matters that I don't think should be obscure. Uh, but uh, as of right now, people are not uh, don't know about them, so I'm trying to uh, shed some light. Um, now, we just, last episode, we just got finished going through uh, Dewey B. Larson's outline of the deductive development of the reciprocal system of theory. And, um, you know, that's kind of like laying the groundwork for understanding how his thought process works and how the system works itself. Today, we're going to be uh, going through, starting to go through, his final book, uh, which is called The Beyond Space and Time. Now, as you know, Lar uh, Larson's uh, basic theory is that the universe is made out of motion. It's not made out of matter. It's not made out of energy. It's made out of motion. And motion, uh, other people have said that before, including uh, Thomas Hobbes, I think Rene Descartes, and um, uh, somebody else as well. But um, Larson made it stick a little bit uh, better because he defined motion as the relationship between space and time. Okay, so space and time are these two entities that come together in motion. And they have a reciprocal relationship with each other, meaning that they are basically identical to each other, but they are the numerator and denominator of a fraction. And that, that whole fraction is the motion. And um, really every kind of scientific phenomena that you can think of is some type of relationship between space and time. And space and time have uh, the identical qualities. Space, uh, we know to be three-dimensional or more. And time, therefore, is three-dimensional or more. And time, we know to progress. Things are always getting later and later and later. And therefore, space also progresses. Things are moving farther and farther apart. And we see that in the uh, progression, uh, recession of the distant galaxies. Now, uh, Larson's uh, early work, uh, he uh, was a mining engineer. And um, uh, most of his early experimental work was on um, chemi chemi chemical matters. Uh, he was trying to figure out an equation for the interatomic distance. And then once he started writing books, his first, uh, his first book was called The Case Against the Nuclear Atom, uh, really saying that there is no nucleus. An atom does not have a nucleus. An atom is a kind of, is a motion. It's a combination of motions. And um, that wasn't directly related to his theory. Then after that, he came, this is about 1959, and uh, after that, he came out with his structure of the physical universe, which is primarily on um, chemical relations, uh, also some, um, you know, atomic relations and astronomical relations. Uh, but then uh, he expanded the theory uh, because it is a system of theory. It's something that you can... Uh, take these original uh, 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 postulates and you can apply them once you learn kind of you have to kind of learn how to apply them once you learn how to apply them then you can apply them to any subject so it's a system um, and so he in the 60s he began to apply his um, his his uh, postulates or his system to economics and he did a couple books on economics one is called the road to permanent prosperity 
and the other one is called The Road to Full Employment. Uh, we will go over those books at some point. Um, I'm still uh, trying to parse out the, uh, the one on the permanent prosperity, uh, which is the more important one, I think. Um, but then, you know, he, he wrote a lot of books on astronomy, quasars and pulsars. He had this book called The Neglected Facts of Science in the early 80s. Um, and then in the 80s, he kind of revamped his structure of the physical universe to put it out in three volumes. The first volume uh, was called Nothing But Motion, and that introduced a lot of the physical relations, um, uh, reference systems and atoms and, um, you know, kind of just the, the basic nuts and bolts. And then uh, the second book in the series, even though it came out third, uh, was called Basic Properties of Matter. That's on uh, chemical relations, you know, interatomic distance, melting and boiling points, heat, specific heat, compressibility, um, and also the uh, charges, electromagnetic charges, um, isotopes, all kinds of things uh, related to chemistry. And then um, his uh, the last book in the series that came out in 1984 is uh, The Universe of Motion, which is a uh, astronomical um, work. Um, but then uh, he died in 1990, and uh, posthumously, this last book came out that's called Beyond Space and Time. And this is where he goes beyond space and time, and he applies the reciprocal system of theory to metaphysics and um, philosophy and religion and... Um, you know, I just kind of read some of the chapter titles that he has. The Nature of Science, uh, Reaching Outward, Levels of Existence, um, and uh, Communication, Revelation, uh, Information, Miracles, Emotions, Memory, and thinking, um, the stuff of dreams, uh, dream interpretation, free will, um, right and wrong, good and evil, moral values, the moral objective, personal aspect of ethics, uh, humanism, Religion Reexamined, East and West, and Outlook for Communication. And uh, that's communication with uh, extraterrestrials, more or less. The Road Ahead, and uh, Survival. And uh, that's really survival of uh, the soul. And Human Destiny, so where we're going. So those are most of the chapters in this book, uh, Beyond Space and Time. Uh, we'll kind of uh, try to go through each one of these chapters um, in brief, you know, not today, but uh, gradually we'll try to get through them. Maybe today we'll just try to get through the first couple chapters. Okay, first uh, in the preface, um, he says, I am examining some of the fundamentals of biology, for instance, not as a specialist in biology, but as a specialist in fundamentals, a fundamentalist. And this is the pioneer expedi expedition into this hitherto scientifically uncharted region. And, um, you know, as a fundamentalist, he's, he's basically starting with the fundamentals, those relations having to do with space and time, and then he's constructing his whole universe from that. So he's, he's you know, breaking it down, starting at the 
um, at the most basic level and building up his universe. And, you know, as I said in uh, previous episodes, uh, you know, the first that uh, Larson first came up with his this idea, he's working on this equation for the interatomic distance. And he eventually uh, kind of had this epiphany uh, back in about 1930 that said, why don't you know take that equation that you're working on and just assume that space and time are reciprocals of each other? And so he plugged that into the equation and it was like the answer popped out, uh, you know, or an answer popped out. And, uh, you know, he's like, wow, you know, that was very unexpected. And so months later, he was working on another equation that had to do with a uh, similar matter. And he had the same idea. Why don't you try plugging space, just assuming that space and time are reciprocals of each other and plug it into the equation. And he did that and another fruitful result occurred. Uh, you know, he got another answer and um, he started doing it more systematically and he realized that he was getting answer after answer after answer to problems that he was having. Then he started plugging, uh, taking that same assumption and plugging it into uh, conundrums that the legacy scientists had about specific problems, long-standing problems in science, things that scientific that scientists have been stumped by, and that haven't been able to kind of uh, make any advancement over a period of years. He started plugging into those and he started getting answers about those. And then he was kind of finally like, I think I'm onto something. You know, I'm going to try to make, uh, you know, a um, systematic study of this and to, to you know, figure this out. Um, he had to go back and, you know, go back in the history see the history of all all of this and and uh figure things out so from the from the period of about 1930 until up to about 1950 he was working with what he called the inductive phase of the reciprocal system and so the inductive phase the inductive reasoning is really where you are working from the specific to the general so you're trying to take specific um, observations, specific results, uh, empirical results that you're get it, that you've gotten from uh, doing experiments or other people doing experiments, and taking these specific results and applying it to general, um, general, you know, laws or general. Uh, ramifications of these specific instances. So he says, you know, inductive reasoning is essentially a recourse to probability. So when you're using inductive reasoning, you, you not, know, uh, not only need to be able to uh, apply it to the general uh, principle, but then you have to verify it through um, other means. Um, so the, the uh, inductive reasoning is like a, a probability. What are, the, what are the probabilities that, um, you know, if this applies to this specific thing, that it would also apply to this other thing? And this is, you know, similar uh, for anybody who's watched any of my videos on Tree of Life. Uh, similar to the um, side of the uh, the pillar uh, on the tree that has to do with intuition and um, imagination um, and um, uh, 
really like even anticipation, um, revelation, and insight. Uh, these things, um, you know, they kind of, they come to you. And it's really being uh, uh, where you're taking kind of a specific instance and you're hypothesizing, well, what if this applies to everything? Um, now, that is not valid in and of itself. It requires verification as well. You can make a kind of a hypothesis about this, but it needs to be verified. Um, the, the opposite isn't true for, in, for deductive reasoning, which is more on the other side of the, of, of the tree of life, where um, when you go from the general to the specific, um, you, don't, you don't necessarily need to uh, verify that. So here he says, an independent verification uh, of the conclusions thus reached is essential. Okay, now, um, so once he got to a certain point about 1950 with this reciprocal system going through this, uh, you know, having the, having the specific result and then uh, trying to see if it applies in the general case, uh, once he was satisfied that he had, that he was on to something, then he switched to a deductive development. And that's where we, you know, just left off yesterday where we're going through the deductive development of the reciprocal system. And it's just like, if this, then this, if this, then this, we've got the general, you know, the general idea. And those are the postulates of the theory here. Here's the general. And now we see, does it apply in this specific, you know, how do we apply it to this specific instance how to apply it to this specific thing and so um you know he through this in deductive process you know he eventually arrives at okay this is what an atom is this is what a photon is this is what an electron is um you know so that is that is what we went through uh for the past 15 episodes of this was his deductive development and that you know, he did that for the rest of his life from 1950 until about 1990 when he died. Now, this book came out in 1995, this book here, Beyond Space and Time. Uh, it was uh, published posthumously by his, his widow, and uh, Dorothy, and she uh, took some heat because uh, a lot of the kind of a hard-headed scientists that were involved with Larson uh, through ISIS, the uh, International Society for a Unified Science, um, and people that followed him in the journal and, and contributed to the journal Reciprocity um, that was uh, active in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, they were Im uh, almost embarrassed by this beyond space and time because they looked at Larson as really like a hard-headed, cold-blooded scientist. And here he is coming out with all this fluffy stuff, um, uh, liberal arts stuff uh, about free will and right and wrong and, uh, and uh, you know, dream interpretation and uh, revelation and religion. And they're, they're like, this is not science. You know, this is like social science at best. Um, and, you know, this is Larson. Larson was writing this stuff for his own edification. He never wanted this to be published. Um, and so a lot of the people were very angry about the release of this Beyond Space and Time volume. Uh, and, you know, I mean, it's hard to say. You, you, I don't know if this is a complete work. It seems to be pretty complete. You know, it seems to be that uh, all 28 chapters or whatever are, you know, his pretty much his full thoughts on the matter. But you never know. You never know whether he actually wanted this to go out or not because he, he died before he had the personal chance to publish it. So anyway, um, uh, 
we're just gonna in the last couple minutes here we'll just look at the third chapter uh the um the uh, it's called the reciprocal system and here he's just saying the common denominator of matter and non-matter is motion now again he's he's looking at the two different halves of the universe that he constructed and this is his difference you know one of his breaks with Einstein you know Einstein is really saying that the speed of light is the maximum speed of the universe nothing can move faster than the speed of light Larson is saying that the speed of light is the midpoint of the universe and half the universe is moving slower than the speed of light and then the other half of the universe is moving faster than the speed of light and those two halves are reciprocals of each other. They're inverses of each other, meaning that they are identical, except they have space and time inverted. At, you know, in the slow side of the universe, the relationships are all space over time. And in the fast side of the universe, the relationships are time over space. Um, and so he calls this half of the universe the material sector, and he calls this half of the universe the cosmic sector. And so the cosmic sector is where we get all of these metaphysical relations. You know, the first dozen books or whatever, 15 books that he wrote were mainly having to do with the material sector, even though he, he dabbled into the, co into the cosmic sector. But this here, this last book, is a full uh, expose, uh, so to speak, on the cosmic sector. Okay, we'll stop there and we'll start up uh, again with uh, chapter three here uh, next time. All right, have a great day. See you later.